This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to a special series on the Herbalife FCPA Enforcement Action. Over the next five episodes, I am joined by five top compliance practitioners to take a look at some of the issues in this case. We begin with Mike Bolkoff, considering how he would have handled this case had he been approached by Herbalife. We then consider the lack of a monitor in Herbalife and some of the reasons by Jay Rosen. Matt Kelly considers the role of the board of directors and how they failed in this case. Jonathan Marks considers the role of gatekeepers in this case and decries a lack of skepticism at the board of directors. We conclude with Jonathan Armstrong taking a look at this case from the UK and UK Bribery Act angle and find some Scottish cases which might inform a response. It's a podcast series I know you'll enjoy. Lots to unpack in the Herbalife case. These episodes are relatively short, 10 to 12 minutes each, so easily digestible. The special podcast series on the Herbalife FCPA Enforcement Action are a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network. What do, what do you do? What does Mike Volkoff do when the Volkoff Law Group gets a call from a potential client or a client that, hey, we've got this SEC subpoena. What do we do? Well, first thing you do, Tom, is uh, you pray. But uh, And then after that, you, I mean, imagine beginning to try to uncover this or unravel this scheme that has tentacles from China and the base of the sort of corrupt activity occurred in China, but it also involves members of the senior management. We had the LA executive who was advising the Chinese head of China on how to evade certain controls. And we also have a board that failed to exercise adequate supervision, in my view, of internal audit. And, uh, and we had no compliance department. I mean, literally no compliance department. So when you walk into a situation like this, how do you, how do you start to unravel this? Well, it's going to be a step by step thing. If you come in to me, uh, you start with building your alliance with whoever it is that first contacts you and then ultimately get to the board and to uh, senior management, but mainly to the board to tell them, here's what we need to do in this situation. But, you know, keep in mind that the you've got people, it's kind of like they're little traps along the way where you could hit people who may have exposure in this situation. So you have to build credibility here. And, um, I thought, uh, you know, Patrick Stokes from Gibson Dunn did a terrific job, but I bet you this took, you know, a long time for him to get the credibility needed to get the buy-in from the companies higher ups and the board to say, go over there and take no prisoners in China and dig out whatever you need. We're going to support you financially, but we're also going to support you uh, in terms of unraveling this mess. And the problem is they probably didn't understand in the beginning the full scope of this, you know, horrific mess till they came in and started to uh, unravel it. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. So a lot of times what I see people do is they start you know, sort of pulling at the thread, the first thread. Don't overwhelm the board. Don't overwhelm senior management. Explain to them the risks here as if we don't do enough and then go from there uh, in terms of unra- pulling the thread and then more and more will come out. Uh, just one side note, Tom. I mean, I think we've seen an example of a situation you and I are familiar with years ago with Alstom. When, remember, DOJ was having trouble getting their subpoenas complied with. 
And that was because even within house count, I mean, outside council in there, they couldn't get the support of the organization to do what they had to do to bring uh, this matter forth. And they had to switch outside council at least, I think, two times before they got to that. And they delayed and lost a lot of valuable points in terms of their cooperation. What's amazing, by contrast here, going back to Herbal Life, is First off, they didn't have a compliance monitor put into place, nor, but they did receive full credit for their cooperation. So whatever was done early on, it sort of built momentum and went in at a steady pace and eventually led to the findings that they did in terms of uh, China and the problems in, uh, uh, in China. But you know, remember that the problems in China ultimately came back to reflect back on some of the senior management and also the board itself. So, but I think that that part sort of came more at the end. I think you, you, you described quite well what you would have done, the conversations you would have had with the board and senior management, but you also have to deal with the prosecutors. You also have to deal with the Securities and Exchange Commission. What kind of conversation do you have with them? Uh, my feeling with dealing with the prosecutors and most of them and including the SEC is you try to be upfront with them, uh, and pretty candid about what you're trying to accomplish at the company. Uh, one rule that, uh, that I've pretty much followed and I don't think there's much support for, well, there's some, but not as much from my perspective is that I, um, encourage my clients when we deal with the government i like to bring a representative with me in other words a general counsel or the chief compliance officer or whoever i want to make a representation about what they plan to do to the government it's uh, there uh, but on the other hand what i've noticed is a lot of law firms the big law firms a lot of times don't take anybody in and they like to have their own conversations and then report it back to the client and i think uh clients are getting a little more sophisticated and wondering whether they're getting the full picture when a counsel comes back and tells them how the conversation went with the government so i like to be up front with the government and i also like to establish a relationship with a representative from the company so that they can look that person in the eye and trust them or not so for example when i was a prosecutor i liked uh having uh, a representative from the company there and i would ask them and they would look at me and say okay i promise you we are going to do this we're going to do that and there was somebody to hold accountable as opposed to an outside counsel who you know can massage a client or whatnot we've had several cases uh tom as you know and you've written a lot about this where the legal fees were like extraordinary I mean, just like almost obscene in some cases. And there have been lookbacks that have occurred by uh, various companies to see what, in fact, they got for the dollar. And also, what, were they getting an accurate picture in terms of the interactions with the uh, Justice Department? And so here, what whatever you may say about herbal life, uh, you know, this was a, I know it's, it sounds like a lot of money. It's, a, you know, harsh settlement, but given what they were looking at and how bad their, I think their, their sort of perception and reputation was with the government, um, I think they came out great here. And that's a tribute to what I think is a relationship that Patrick Stokes, who used to be the head of the FCPA unit, he has instant credibility when he's talking to the people he used to work with in partnership at the SEC or at DOJ. They believe him when he says something. And I think I would be honest and tell them what you're trying to accomplish. And they get it. They know what he's trying to do. But uh, going back on that point, on the other hand, if he doesn't deliver, then the government's going to have trouble. So, like, you know, don't make a promise you're going to do something and then come in and try to, you know, walk it back. In other words, be careful about the representations you make. And there's a lot of, look, a lot of it is just basic common sense in terms of dealing in a professional way with people, not turning it into a, a, you know, a battle royale and not getting all stuck. But on the other hand, not just laying over, you know, turning over and letting them do whatever they want. You've got to be professional, but also be respectful. 
Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode in the five-part exploration of the Herbalife FCPA Enforcement Action on this special series of the FCPA Compliance Report. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow where we take up another episode. This special five-part podcast series is a special production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Thanks so much for listening, and I look forward to visiting with you again.